His power is real. And you shall make a difference. I don't believe that God saved us uh, without a purpose. And I don't take Acts chapter 1 verse 8 very lightly. Because that word power in the Greek is dunamis. It is an explosiveness that God gives us. It also means efficacy. It is a spirit that God gives you that causes you to be effective in whatever it is that you do. But God does not want us to just be effective in our own personal lives. But God wants us to be effective in the mission where with why he saved you. The world is living under a delusion. When I first started receiving this message from the Lord, I saw in my mind the movie The Matrix. And some of you may have seen the movie, maybe some of you haven't. And it wasn't that I used that story for my sermon, but there was a specific thought of the movie that kept popping up in my prayer. And that was the fact that the world in that movie was living under a delusion. Yes. They kept believing that something was real that wasn't real. And those that had been unplugged from the world had a real shock when they came to the realization that they had been living in a delusion all this time. Just stick with me this one, it's going to be all right. I come to declare to you this morning that the world lives under a heavy delusion of the enemy. A delusion is a belief of something that's true that's not true. It's a false idea that if I follow this idea, I will get some kind of result. The delusion is that the result that you're believing that you're going to receive never comes down the pipeline. They are, as we call it, uh, chasing a carrot. The carrot is used to make a person do something, and when it looks like they're getting closer to it, uh, the carrot is moved a little further away. And consequently, as much as they try, as hard as they try, they never seem to be able to catch the carrot. Many are chasing for self-satisfaction, but they can't seem to find it. They're chasing for it in all the wrong places. Uh, they try to find self-satisfaction in self-success. They try to find self-satisfaction uh, in relationships with women and men or boys or, or girls and they can't find it. Uh, they're trying to get someone else to please them uh, in a way that only God can please them. And so they live uh, a life of delusion. Many are trying to get deliverance in their life. They're trying to get deliverance with a pill. They buy and spend 80, 90, 100 dollars on the pill because they're depressed. They try to get deliverance from uh, the spirit of nicotine and they spend 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars for a patch that they put on their arm, yet they never get their deliverance. They keep searching for deliverance over sadness and depression, and yet there is no deliverance in our society because they're looking for it in the wrong place. They're being lied to, and they're living a lot of delusion, thinking that somehow, at the end of this whole struggle, I am going to be set free. What is happening in our society is that the devil knows the truth. <laughs> And the world doesn't. See, we think the devil is dumb. The devil's not dumb. He was actually created before humanity. And then all through the creation of humanity, all through the thousands of years of humanity, the devil has been around observing, paying attention, watching, reading the word. He got this word down pat. Right. Why do you think he was able to quote the word to Jesus when he took him and took him in the wilderness? He didn't pull out his Bible and say, well, does the Bible say? He got that word down on the inside. He knows the word. He knows that his time is short. And he knows that if you ever get a hold of the gospel, you'll come out from under the illusion of the fact that somehow you can have a successful life without God. He keeps the world thinking that somehow 
if we pull Jesus out of the schools, if we take Jesus off the campuses, if we take Jesus out of politics, if we take Jesus out of commerce, if we take Jesus out of the families, that everything is going to be all right. And there's enough people that are living this life of delusion that they go along with this falsehood. They begin to rebuke and reject Christ. They begin to push Christ away, thinking that somehow the problem is Jesus. They argue with their family members and say, you go to church too much, and you're already always reading your Bible, and you're always praying because if you just didn't go to church, if you didn't spend that much time with God, then things would be better. But it's a delusion. It's a lie from the pit of hell because they don't understand that Satan has a grip on them and that they're walking in darkness and the end of the thing is destruction. The delusion is seen in Psalms chapter 2 verse 1. This is why I often say I'm glad to be saved because I lived in this delusion for years before I met Jesus. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, the psalmist under the anointing and the power of God says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The vain thing that they imagine is that somehow we can survive without God. It is a delusion to think that Jesus is not important. It is a thing that has cast a net over our society especially here in the United States. The only thing that seems to be important is sports. Not that I'm against sports, but nothing have should usurp authority over God. Sports are in, important, singing is important, dancing is important, education is important, money is important, and all of these things have cast a net that they're way more important than God. But all of those things that people are getting caught up seem to be taking them down to nothing. Even after a football player reaches fame, the fame goes to his head. Pride begins to overtake his life, and they begin to do all manner of diabolical things. So what are you talking about, preacher? Listen, it's diabolical to sock a woman in the face and knock her out in the, in the elevator. And then try to make some excuse that I have a reason to do it. It's devilish. And it's propped by the sport industry. It's devilish to spend all your money partying and drinking and sexing all around with all kind of women, having babies everywhere, and then not fathering any of them. It's diabolical. But yet we think it's cute. We think it's great. They're a football player. They're a singer. They're a dancer. And we fall into the delusion that somehow Jesus is not important. We do not understand that in him is life. People are trying to live life without him, but in him is life. It is only in Jesus that we have mercy. It is only mercy that is holding back the judgment of God. One of the gentlemen in our class asked me, what is this dispensation of grace? I said, what it is is a time frame where God's mercy is enacted. If you can remember back or if you've read your Bible, before we entered into grace, we were in an age of judgment. Every time Israel did wrong, they were judged. When they murmured against Moses, thousands were killed. When they took earrings and made a golden calf, thousands were killed. There was judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment. But then came Jesus. And we stepped into an age of grace. And now people can murmur against God and nothing happens. Now people can cuss folks out and nothing happens. And because judgment is not measured out speedily, people think that God is not paying attention. The only thing that's going on is that the mercy of God is holding back the judgment of God. Because in him is life and in him is the light of man. It's mercy. It's the only thing 
that's keeping us safe from the destructive power of sin. Our nation is sinning so much that if it wasn't for the mercy and the grace of God, we would already be wiped out. That Solomon and Gomorrah was completely wiped out. I mean, the whole city was decimated. There was no rock standing because of homosexuality. Yet we in this nation have passed a law, a national law, saying that this diabolical act is okay. And then God stands there. And the mercy is holding them back. Reprobate minds, people running to and fro, living destructive lifestyles, blinded by Satan, lied to by Satan, deceived by Satan, and the world just loves it. The world loves it. The Lord says that the men, they love darkness. Because their deeds are evil, but I believe they love it because there's no judgment. If you could put your hand on a hot stove and the burning did not hurt you, you would do it often. You say, hey man, look at this. Hey, I'm gonna show you something. Look at this. But the reason we don't do that. Because there is a consequence to that action. And if the judgment of God was measured out according to the consequence of our action, half the stuff we do, we wouldn't do. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. I told him going to talk to you this morning. I'm trying to hurt your feelings. But listen, I'm tired of the devil. Make me mad. The devil make me sick. He don't like me, I don't like him. He's using every, every tool to his exposure. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. <laughs> He's using every tool to his, his disposal to push his kingdom forward. I told him my class this is mine. I said I wasn't going to say if I got saved. I don't have anything against Facebook. But the problem I do have is the people on Facebook. Because it's a tool that God gave us. God gave us the internet. God gave us spaceships. God gave us doctors. God gave us the wisdom to be able to crack an atom. All the wisdom that's in this world comes from God. The difference and the problem is that the devil takes it and uses it for his purposes. He uses the internet. He uses Twitter. He uses Facebook. And the church doesn't use it. We do not articulate the gospel on Facebook. We show ourselves and we show cakes and, and bunnies and, and baskets and then ourselves again and pants and shoes and then a hat and then ourselves again and then we tell a joke and then we forward a nasty video and then ourselves again and we do not use a tool that can be used to propagate the gospel worldwide. We have completely surrendered many tools, tool after tool after tool that God has released into the world, into the hands of the devil, the TV, the radio, everything. But God has given us the power and the ability to use everything that he has given to our disposal to articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ. The pastor is trying to make me feel bad, not really. I'm trying to get you out of the delusion that this world is living under. The delusion that somehow the stuff that is being used by the enemy is not affecting anyone's life. It's affecting marriages. It's destroying people's hearts. People are literally fighting and cussing. Children are, are breaking up relationships in school over something that was written online. Literally people kill one another. But I have yet to hear somebody getting saved as a result of Facebook. Yeah, I need to be silent. Because God is really trying to speak to us. He's trying to say, listen, open your eyes and see what's really going on. See how God is trying to empower us to make a difference. Because people are dying and going to hell. 
And some of you are very shrewd and, and very gifted in the ability of being able to use the online social media. But we're not using it the way God would want us to use it. You have uh, the, the ability to touch thousands and thousands of people all over the world. Some of you are great writers. And if you were to take that ability to the right and use that tool that God had given us, there would be people over in Japan and people over in China and people over in Africa and Europe that would be touched by the word of God that God will plant in your heart that he will allow you to our but we think that that avenue doesn't belong to us. This is not the platform to deliver the gospel. School is no longer the platform to deliver the gospel. Twitter is not the platform to deliver the gospel. Politics is not the platform to deliver the gospel. Family reunion is not the platform to deliver the gospel. College is not the platform to deliver the gospel. At the movie theater is not the platform to deliver the gospel. There is really no platform anywhere in our society that's acceptable to deliver the gospel except for church on Sunday morning. And people really say, listen, keep church inside the church. Don't bring it out here. This is not the platform for delivering the gospel. But I got news for you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Every platform that God gives us is a platform for us to deliver the gospel. And God will empower you if you will have enough boldness to step up and step out and say, I declare the word of God because there's power in the word of God. There's deliverance in the word of God. There's victory in the word of God. His power is real. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1 makes it very clear how Jesus feels about the diabolical ways of sinners. There is this false teaching that somehow I'm going to end up in victory. That I can live this way and there's no consequence. Yeah. That is the biggest delusion that God, that the enemy has played on people's lives. They really feel deep down inside that I'm a good person. Yeah. And because I'm a good person, I can live any kind of way that I want. And I will accidentally end up in heaven. God wants you to know this morning you've got to grab a hold of the truth and hide it down in your heart. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the wrong scripture. In chapter 2. Sorry. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with firm words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation summers not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them down, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Solomon and Gomorrah into ashes, Condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after shall live ungodly. Yes. And deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Yes. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. There is an end to ungodliness and it is punishment. And we cannot stand by and watch people live a life that leads them to punishment. The Bible is telling us clearly that our salvation is not a new concept. 
It's not something that God thought of at the last minute and said, oh, maybe I'll save them. But God had already prophesied thousands of years ago that he was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. God had already made known that he was going to pour his spirit out on us and we that knew God would do exploits. God had already decided that he knew that it was going to take an army of people to be able to offset what the enemy is trying to do to his creation, humanity. God already saw you before the foundation of the world that he was going to save you and fill you with power so that you would be able to stand against the onslaughts of the enemy. And he wants you to understand this morning that he has established you. And what that means is God has planted you in a place for longevity. He did not save you just for the day or for tomorrow. But God has established you. He has planted you to in a place where the enemy will not be able to remove you. He will not be able to push you to the left nor push you to the right. But we have been partakers of the word of God. We have been partakers of the anointing of God and the power of God. That's for purpose and for mission. That mission is to destroy the works of darkness. That mission is to pull people out of darkness, hanging the garment spotted by the flesh, and help them to come to a knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. God has not saved you, so you can sit on the sidelines and do nothing, but God has anointed you and given you power, given you effectiveness in your mind, effectiveness in your heart, that the world doesn't affect you, that it affects everybody else. Why? Because God wants you to be a light that shines in darkness. God says you're not going be under a bushel, but he's going to place you on the hill, and everybody's going to be looking up to you, because there's going to be something different about you, and the thing that's going to be different is the power of the Holy Ghost, it's not about going to church on Sunday, it's about having a relationship with a God that cannot lie, God said that sin shall be destroyed, and righteousness shall live forever, God needs you, each and every one of you, to stand up and be counted, and say, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait till you be in do with power from on high. Don't go nowhere. Don't go preaching. Don't go teaching. Don't have no barbecue sales. Go up there and praise me and worship until the power that comes down from on high and dwells your body. The Bible lets us know in Acts chapter 1 that they all went into an upper room. They began to praise and worship God. They even list all the people that were there. Even Mary, Mother Jesus was there. Mother Jesus' mother was there. And they were praying, and the Holy Ghost fell, and he filled them with power. They began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance. The Bible goes on to say that Peter stands up with the eleven, and he preaches the first sermon. And he preaches so hard that the Bible says that 3,000 people get baptized because their hearts were pricked. Oh, that's a powerful anointed word. I wish I could preach like that. I could preach the house down. They got saved. They were washed in the blood. The Bible goes on to say that two of them were going into the temple for prayer. There was a man sitting at the gate of beautiful. He was laying from his birth. And he said, give me some money. He said, silver and gold, have we none? But such as we have given unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. We see the power of God being activated. 3,000 people being saved. 4,000 people being saved. Miracles begin to happen. And the world was mad about it. But Paul says, listen, this is nothing new. This thing was prophesied a long time ago. All the prophets declared about this time that the seed of Abraham would make a difference in the world. I come to declare to you that we are the seed of Abraham. And we have been empowered by God. And we shall make a difference. God didn't plant this church in the East Valley just to be an ornament. But God planted this church in this valley to make a difference, to change people's lives, to turn them from darkness to light, to turn their minds around, to turn their hearts around, to give a new start, to raise them up higher, to help them understand that Jesus loves you. This I know because the Bible tells me so. He planted us here so that people could have Jesus 
power is real. Take it from a drug addict. A crackhead. $700 a day on cocaine. Jesus' power is real. Take it from a gambler that gambled every penny away, even lost her house. so lost 
that they can't find their way home? What kind of delusion is the enemy putting over the minds of people that they're 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, walking around lost, trying to find a church home? Yes. Yes. And the reason why is because the church is not on the hill. It's hidden under a bushel. It's part of the delusion we have become part of the world. And I know people were a little uneasy when I was talking about Facebook, but listen, the Facebook of the saints is just like the world's Facebook. It don't look no different. None of the wording, none of the stuff that's said, none of the stuff that's pushed forward doesn't look any different. We're under a bushel. We, there's no light anywhere. We have avenues that we can use on our jobs. Our conversation must be about the Lord. All that we do, God has taken it into account. All that we say, the Lord is recording it down. And every soul that comes to God as a result of your testimony, God gives you a crown of righteousness. He puts another star, another diamond. Your reward is in heaven. Your labor of love will not go unrewarded. But I fear that if we don't wake up, if we don't shake ourselves, that we're going to miss the rapture. I fear that we're going to be so like the world that when the shaking takes place, we're going to be shook. Last thought. They had a hundred pastors go and pray for the presidential candidate, Donald Trump. And I'm not trying to be prejudiced, but it was a hundred black pastors. Because you know how politics are. They, they try to go after certain segments. And then there was another pastor. And he started on TV calling all those pastors prostitutes and pimps and saying that they're pimping because they're trying to talk to Donald Trump because he's rich. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, the riches of the wicked are stored up for the righteous. And I thought, so you would rather have a president who doesn't want prayer who cancels the National Day of Prayer for two years and invokes Islamic prayer yes. versus a candidate that says, yes, will you please lay hands on me and pray for me? Yes. So you would have, rather have a candidate that's for killing babies and that has created an unemployment rate in the black culture of over 50% versus a candidate who can bring jobs to the nation that says, yes, lay hands on me and pray for me. Now, I'm not a Trump fan. I'm not anybody's fan. But I'm watching pastors diabolically trying to stop us from having a man in the White House who wants prayer. We've already taken prayer out of everything that you can take prayer out of. There's only one place left to take prayer out of. That's Congress. They pray before Congress opens, and they're fighting to take it out. If you can get a president that hates prayer, and Congress leaders that don't want prayer, are we in trouble? We, the people of God, must understand our role. We have to pull as many out of the fire. Jesus. You got friends going to hell. Jesus. You really do. Jesus. Oh, you keep telling me, tell them again. Yeah. You keep telling me, tell them again. Yes. Because sin is very destructive. Yes. Yes. And no, we're not judging people. We're not here to judge. We're here to help. 
Everyone has a past. And everyone has a future. You can never affect a person's past. You can't change it. You can't alter it. But you can help a person change their future. And if they would turn their life to God, their future will be bright. Understand? His power is real. And you shall make a difference. You're going to make a difference. And the reason why I know is because God put you in this church. He put you in this church because he wants to empower you to make a difference. So I just want to learn the word and have a fat head. That's fine. But after you get the fat head, then go out and, and let God use you to make a difference Amen. in somebody's Amen. life. I'm not against learning the word. I believe we should dig in that word and learn everything we can. Amen. What I'm against is having a whole bunch of word in your head and you don't ever tell anybody. You just keep it all to yourself. You don't share it. People sitting right next to you, sick. Sin sick, crying. The boy ever left me. I don't know what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Come to Jesus so he can give you some self-esteem. Come to Jesus so he can give you self-esteem. I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking about old people acting like that. I understand a young person because they're new dealing with heart issues. That's, that's difficult. But when you get 40 years old, at some point, you should have some, you should understand that it's a delusion to think that someone else can make you happy. I don't went from preaching to meddling. Because God does it even though you don't deserve it. Yes. The Holy Ghost begins to strengthen you in areas where you used to be weak, even without you trying to be strengthened. God works on you in such a way that sometimes two years can go by and you don't even detect that you've changed, but people come and they see you and they go, man, there's something different about you. And they say that, and you're like, well, what, what's, what's different? It's like, I don't know, there's just something different. And what it is, is God has been working on you on the inside, and the light of God is starting to shine out on the outside. Your hair is still the same color, the same length. You still wear the same kind of clothes. No, I'm not dressing all churchy and all that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. There, there is an aura of the power of God in your life. And God wants you to know that that power is real. You can't see it, but it's real. And it's through that power that God will use you to make a difference in someone else's life. This morning, the Holy Ghost moved aggressively because God was trying to touch us just to let us know that he's still here. He was pulling on us to, to help us to understand, listen, I'm real, 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 I'm real. Come to me, come to me, come and watch what I can do. I can lift you up, I can raise you up, I can give you joy, I can make you laugh. Come to me, come to me. God said, listen, I'm a real God. We come here to get that, and then when we leave out, we let God use us. Don't hold back on God. Let God use you. It's our altar. 
What is the altar call for? The altar call is, is designed for people that heard the word. I said, I don't know nothing about this Holy Ghost stuff. I don't know. God is real. What's that? It's a time for a person to come forward and say, you know, I want more of God. I sense the presence of God in the atmosphere. I, I, what does God want from me? It's like after Peter preached, the men said, brethren, what should we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So after hearing a sermon like this, and you understand the delusion of the world, you got to say, well, what do you want me to do? And the answer is this, repent. It means to turn to God, say, God, I want to serve you. And be baptized. That's baptism in the water. That's why we have a baptismal pool. We have clothes that you can change into. Why should I get baptized? It's for the remission of sins. According to Acts 2.38. And then God promises to give you the Holy Ghost. Why do I need the Holy Ghost? Because Jesus said you must be born of water and spirit. Or you can't get into the kingdom of God. And so it becomes very kind of simplistic in the way God has set the Bible up. It's not some odd thing over here and there's some odd thing over there. They all work together. Jesus said I died on the cross. And now by the grace of God. I extend you the opportunity of salvation. Grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve to be saved. But God says, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Mercy is, I have compassion on you because I know your struggle. Sin is very devastating. And because I'm merciful, I'm going to extend grace. Grace is an action. Mercy is a feeling. It's the heart of God. He's a merciful God. And because of his mercy, he has extended grace. And through grace we are saved by faith. That means you've got to believe it. You've got to believe what God said. I'm throwing out the life preserver. But you gotta grab it or you will drown. Mercy is I'm standing on the side of the boat and I feel compassion for the fact that you're drowning. I'm watching you. You're flapping your hands and you're waving and you're doing everything. And because of my compassion, I grab the life preserver and out of grace, I throw it to you. I don't have to throw it. You didn't do nothing to make me throw it. But because of my compassion, I throw it to you. Now the, it's your opportunity to grab it. That's what the altar call is. It's your opportunity to grab the mercy and the grace of God. If you've never been born again in the Bible, if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, you can come right now. Maybe someone told you to raise your hand and say a prayer. That's fine, I guess. Jesus doesn't say that, though. Jesus said, here's how my grace works. Yes. That if you would be baptized, I'll wash away all your sins. And if you open your heart, I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you'll know it because you'll speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance. And if you want to be born again that way, you can come right now. Come on, close your eyes just for a second. Thank you. Come on.